this was a day uh, that I hoped wouldn't come, and um, I resisted all of the indications that the inevitable was going to happen. And so I woke up this morning and I heard that um, President Hugo Chavez had died. At 58 years old, at the height of his physical and political power, um, Hugo Chavez is probably after Fidel Castro, the greatest uh, Latin American revolutionary of the modern period. Uh, the revolution in Venezuela is known as the Bolivarian Revolution, named after the Venezuelan revolutionary Simon Bolivar. Simon Bolivar, uh, in the 19th century, the 1800s, sought out to liberate all of South America from uh, Spanish colonialism. Uh, he was not successful, but he sparked a great movement, and he recognized that the liberation of the continent would be a political and military undertaking. Hence, the revolution that Hugo Chavez has led is known as the Bolivarian Revolution, after Simon Bolivar, which also suggests that uh, Chavez and his colleagues saw their enterprise as more than a Venezuelan revolutionary project, but a project to economically liberate all of South America and the Caribbean from now U.S. imperialism and the U.S. empire. Bolivar would inspire this new revolutionary upsurge that we see in South America, but it would need its personification in a movement and a leader like Hugo Chavez. In many ways, Hugo Chavez is an unlikely candidate for continental revolutionary. Hugo Chavez comes out of the military. Hugo Chavez uh, was just a very uh, down-to-earth brother, a friend of mine who lived for a couple years in Venezuela, was telling me today about uh, when he first saw Hugo Chavez. Uh, this was about a year, a couple years after the attempted coup in 2002, which was kind of fomented and supported by the United States, which for a couple of hours overthrew uh, the government. But they were celebrating, it was the anniversary of not the coup, but the military's rescuing of Hugo Chavez from uh, the coup plotters. And he said he saw Hugo Chavez, and if you know anything about like North Philly and West Philly, maybe West Oak Lane, Hugo Chavez had on a blue suit and blue gaiters. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Uh, Chavez, <laughs> yeah, that's right, he was something else. I mean, he came from the people. He never lost his connections to the people. He was a revolutionary coming out of the military and out of the poor sections of Venezuelan society. 
was always fond of telling people, both of my grandmothers were black. He said, I'm black and native Indian. And he said, about 17% of me is white, but the 80, other 83% native Indian and African. And he says, I'm proud of my curly hair and my big lips. Yep. And this was in itself a reflection of a great cultural revolution in South and Latin America. Because very, very few leftist political parties had Africans or native people in their leaderships. And most because of the influence of Spanish and American imperialism and racism did not feel that a man of African descent or of Native American descent could lead a revolutionary process. Hugo Chavez was the first, I think, to openly declare himself to be an African. This would set off a whole string of leaders who were non-white assuming the helm of the revolutionary process in South America, most notably uh, Evo Morales, the Native American who was the president of uh, Bolivia. The significance of Bolivia is this is the nation where Che Guevara went to assist the guerrilla movement against the oligarchy and the landlords. And this is where, in 1967, uh, che Guevara was captured and brutally assassinated at the instructions of the American CIA. Today, that nation is led by uh, Evo Morales. However, the Bolivarian Revolution uh, inspired a new movement to the left in South America. And so today, in Ecuador, in uh, Nicaragua, in Bolivia, uh, of course Cuba, and other nations, the trajectory of politics is against neoliberal capitalism. And at the forefront of it is Hugo Chavez and the Venezuelan Revolution. Now, Chavez first came to the attention of the world in 1992, when as a young colonel, he and other leaders in the army attempted to overthrow the corrupt and anti-national regime that was running uh, uh, Venezuela. Now, what do I mean anti-national? In other words, it was a neo-colonial government. It was a government that answered not to the people of Venezuela, but to the multinational corporations based primarily in the United States, and in particular, the oil companies. Venezuela is, the, is estimated to have the second largest oil reserves in the world after Saudi Arabia. If the Venezuelan people could get control of their uh, most important natural resource, and if a government would use those natural resources to end poverty, to end illiteracy, to uh, and this wide income and wealth gap, and to create a society of social justice, it would be a new day for Venezuela and potentially for all of Latin America. Well, that is what the Bolivarian Revolution set out to do. But then it went further because of the spirit of Simon Bolivar. Did I mention Simon Bolivar was a Venezuelan, right? Because of this dream that goes back to the 19th century, 
that not only could a country in Latin America be free, but Latin America as a continent could be free of North American imperialism. This dream was made concrete by Hugo Chavez and the Bolivarian Revolution. So therefore, they were not satisfied to merely create a wealthy nation in Venezuela. They wanted to use the wealth of oil to liberate all of Latin America and the Caribbean. Hugo Chavez therefore becomes as an example, as dangerous as Fidel Castro in the Cuban Revolution. And for the United States, the question becomes, can we deal with one, two, maybe three, four, five Fidels in South America? And what would it mean if this nation with all of this potential oil wealth, uses as it did its wealth to create the Bank of the South. What does this mean? That first of all, they want to break the economic hold of the dollar over economic activity in South America. Then, they created an organization called ALBA, Latin American Bolivarian Alliance. Not all the nations are in it. Of course, Mexico is not in it. Um, Colombia is not in it. But it was the embryo of what would become a economic union of South American countries. The other thing that happens, and this is about a year, year and a half ago, you may have remember reading this in the newspaper, Chavez and the Venezuelan government asked the American and European banks, or tell them I should say, that they want their gold back. They are then saying we prefer not to have even our money in U.S. banks. Take the example of Libya and Gaddafi, $130 billion in U.S. banks, pardon me, $30 billion in U.S. banks, which the U.S. banks seize upon and hold as ransom against the Libyan government. Well, Chavez, and the Venezuelan government said they wanted their gold back and they wanted their money out of the U.S. banks. And hence, the beginnings of the formation of the Bank of the South, a Latin American bank that would be independent of foreign financial interest. Uh, let me just take a step back. I think I mentioned uh, uh, Chavez comes to the attention of the world in 1992. They attempt a coup because they wanted to overthrow the anti-national neo-colonialist uh, puppet regime to the U.S. They fail. Hugo Chavez is arrested. He does two years in prison. When he gets out, he's a national hero. They build up this movement, this Bolivarian movement, movement named after Simone Bolivar. And in 1999, Hugo Chavez runs for president and is elected for the first time uh, on a socialist platform, nationalizing oil, ending poverty, challenging neoliberal capitalism from the United States, and on and on and on. Chavez would win three more elections. The United Socialist Party, which is the political arm of the Bolivarian movement, would win the parliament, they would win the majority of state governments, and would become the dominant political force in the country, in spite of the fact 
that the United States and multinational corporations would fund the opposition, would in 2002 encourage a coup against Chavez. The coup was defeated when the military rescued Chavez from uh, these coup plotters. Now, the question becomes, how did this movement become the powerful force in the nation that it became and the powerful force throughout Latin America? Well, it wasn't always that. When uh, Venezuela was under the control of neoliberal capitalists and, 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 and puppets to the United States, well, they want to keep the people as ignorant as possible, just like here. Uh, the media is used for diversion. Uh, schools are closed down because you don't want to educate people. The, um, the newspapers are in the hands of the rich, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, they enter upon a prolonged uh, and intense political education of the people. Uh, I should say political and ideological education of the people. They did this through the mechanism of what they call Bolivarian circles, where the vanguard in communities, in factories, in farms, would educate the people. There cannot be a successful revolution, and especially one that is based upon the revolutionaries being elected time and time again unless the people are educated. Well, we can see the opposite in this country. The lack of political education leads to the confusion about politics and about interests that exist. Now, the other thing, Hugo Chavez and the United Socialist Party will uh, put forward a platform. First of all, as I say, opposing the U.S. empire. I'll come back to that. What do we mean by the U.S. empire? Why are you using that word? Uh, opposing the U.S. empire. In other words, U.S. military and economic domination of the whole Western Hemisphere. Back in the 19th century, they called this the Monroe Doctrine. Okay? And under the Monroe Doctrine, all of the European powers had to keep their hands off of the Western Hemisphere because this was America's backyard. Uh, and it's this doctrine that informed the Cuban Missile Crisis and the sanctions against the Cuban Revolution. What was the theory? The theory was that the revolution in Cuba was not legitimate nor organic to the Cuban people. It was an export from the Soviet Union. Hence, the Cuban revolution did not have legitimacy. It was not democratic, and it was a foreign uh, import into South America. And under this doctrine, the United States not only imposed sanctions on the Cuban Revolution, which have been now in place for over 50 years, but at the same time said that Cuba could not develop defensive weapons, including nuclear weapons, to defend itself against the nuclear threats of the United States. This is the Monroe Doctrine. Chavez and the Bolivarian Revolution in a position to challenge this in ways that the Cuban Revolution was not. So as opposed to this north-south uh, nexus, in other words, everything that goes on in the southern hemisphere has to be managed from the northern hemisphere or from Europe and North America, what Chavez and the, uh, and the revolution propose is a south-south nexus. So therefore, you might be aware of the fact that Hugo Chavez and the revolution establishes all of these economic ties with countries that are considered the enemies of the United States, like Iran, China, 
uh, Libya, Syria, and so on. And more than that, Hugo Chavez uh, and the foreign ministry of the, Cuba, of the uh, Venezuelan government uh, openly in international bodies challenged U.S. hegemony uh, when many nations in the U.N., including um, in the Security Council, uh, South Africa and Nigeria, voted in favor of giving NATO effectively the right to bomb Libya, Hugo Chavez and the Bolivarian Revolution consistently spoke out against it. As the United States funded uh, anti-Syrian mercenary jihadist terrorist organizations to undermine not just the Syrian regime, but the Syrian nation, again, the Venezuelan government spoke out against it. When the Security Council consistently put more and more sanctions on Iran, Venezuela spoke out against it. Therefore, we see the Venezuelan government not only in terms of the economic reorganization of their own society, but in global international relationships taking a revolutionary stance, a stance against American imperialism and the American empire. They went further. The example of Cuba is this bright example of human generosity that the Venezuelan revolution takes up. For example, when Simon Bolivar, back in the 19th century, was broke, isolated, and had you know, no means to carry out the military political project that he was interested in, he went where? To the Haitian Revolution. And Dessalines and the Haitian Revolution gave him money, gave him boats, gave him printing presses, and so on. In the 21st century, the Venezuelan Revolution repays the favor. And they establish what is known as um, Petro Carib, whereby the Venezuelan government would sell at very low prices petroleum to Haiti and other Caribbean nations at prices far below what they could ever get on the open market for petroleum. And certainly other things that I'm not aware of. This would extend as well to, um, to Cuba and other nations uh, that had been blockaded by the United States. This example of human generosity, uh, which reflects the ethos, the ethics of the revolutionary process, its humanism in opposition to the anti-human policies of the North, of Europe and America. And there are examples all over the world of the effects of the predatory, exploitative uh, policies of the, of the northern tier countries, the advanced capitalist nations. For example, recently, there was a meeting on development at the United Nations. And um, there was a young woman from Mozambique. As you know, Mozambique had to fight a prolonged and protracted armed guerrilla warfare against the Portuguese to win their liberation. Mozambique is a nation that borders South Africa. It is in that southern part of Africa the mineral treasure house of the continent. Uh, the armed struggle in 
Mozambique was led by an organization known as Frey Limo, the Front for the Liberation of Mozambique. And when they come to power, they have uh, several basic objectives. One, to do away with poverty. Two, to do away with illiteracy and to make health care and housing available to everybody. Well, this young woman, who was born again after the revolution, she speaks at the UN and she says that in the time of Fray Limo, in that period between 1975 and 1990, illiteracy had almost been completely eliminated from Mozambique. As a result, however, of World Bank and, I, and International Monetary Fund policies, illiteracy has now risen where only 30% of the population is literate. Now you might ask, well, how did that come about? Well, you don't have to go very far to understand the policy. First of all, the World Bank and IMF say to a nation like Mozambique, the state sector cannot afford these public policies of housing, education, and anti-poverty programs that in order for you to get loans from us, you must do away with these programs. That's what is called structural adjustment. So if you have a nationwide literacy program, what you do is to say, well, you can't afford that, put it in private hands, hire outside private education uh, firms, to do the literacy thing. Well, that's what's happening here in Philadelphia. We call it austerity. They called it structural adjustment. And what we will see is the rise of illiteracy, functional illiteracy, and the creation of a growing uh, precariat, some say underclass, of impoverished people without skills to fit in to a technological economy. These policies, which are now called neoliberal capitalism, neoliberal, that is, let the market decide everything. Get the state out of it. You see what I'm saying? Things such as clean air, education, universal health care, anti-poverty, things that only the state can do. You eliminate that and you say, let the market do it. But everywhere the market has attempted to do it, it has led to disaster for the people. And what we're seeing are these policies reaching the apogee here in the United States. I'll come back to that. Now, here you have Venezuela. The Socialist Party comes to power based upon a program of ending poverty. Well, how do you end poverty if the state cannot marshal the resources and wealth of the country to address the problems of poverty? The market be it in Chile, be it in Colombia, be it in the United States, does not do away with poverty, it increases poverty. And over the last 30 years of neoliberal policies here in the United States, we see more impoverishment, more imprisonment, more disease, more AIDS, more illiteracy. But these were the policies of subduing the national liberation movement's objectives. And if the leaders of the national liberation movement adopts these policies, they become discredited in their own nations, as is the case in South Africa with the African National Congress. If you want an example of what happens politically 
to a liberation movement that adopts neoliberal capitalism as the economic policy for their nation, look at South Africa. Not only has poverty gotten worse since black people got the vote, <laughs> we can come back to that because there's some issues that we might, might parallel what we're dealing with here. Not only has poverty gotten worse, but the state, the police, have become more ruthless in their dealings with the people. And all we have to do is look at what happened last August in South Africa when the South African police shot down striking miners in South Africa. So therefore, the Socialist Party, just on the basis of pragmatic humanism, had to pursue policies of redistribution of wealth, had to take the oil wealth out of the hands of private corporations and put it in the hands of the state so that the state could be the mechanism for the redistribution of wealth. But in so doing, the Bolivarian Revolution is going up against the policies of the United States that are geared towards the economic control of the entire hemisphere. But now there have been examples of what happens when a revolution comes to power through elections but does not conduct political and ideological education of the people and does not arm the people. The great example is Allende in Chile. Uh, the socialist and communist parties in an alliance elected the first socialist president, Salvador Allende, in Chile. Uh, Kissinger and Nixon, from the moment Allende was elected, plotted to bring the Allende government down, to destroy it. And finally, in 1973, carry out a military coup and um, and it ends up uh, with a wave of repression and the death of Salvador Allende. Fidel Castro, a friend of Salvador Allende's and of the Chilean progressive movement, had warned them that you cannot depend upon the old military to defend the revolution. You have to educate the people, you have to arm them, and you really have to get rid of the old uh, military leadership, the generals and colonels and that type of thing. Well, Hugo Chavez in the Bolivarian Revolution learned that lesson. And not long after being elected, Hugo Chavez and them fire most of the old generals, bring up young, uh, ideologically clear people who came into the military from the grassroots, from the poor and working class, elevate them, not people from the bourgeois class who come into the military as a way to live a soft life, create a whole new military leadership. But more than that, let it be known that any attempt to overturn the revolution will be met with not only the mass force, but the armed mass force of the people. And that is what you get with these Bolivarian circles. In Cuba, they call them committees for the defense of the revolution. Okay. Now, U.S. Empire. You know, you usually hear talk of the Roman Empire, the Dutch, the Spanish, of course, the British. And finally, now, the American Empire. And this is the last European or white empire. They know it, and, and those of us who think about these things know it. And that is why 
the United States is the most armed and militarist regime in human history. That is why in our society a culture of violence and preparation for war uh, is constantly uh, taking place, being invented and reinvented. It is actually the last white supremacist empire. If this empire fails, it inaugurates the end of white supremacy as a world system. And we therefore go from the age of Europe to the age of humanity, what I talked about last time as a new axial age where the axis of human civilization shifts from the north to humanity. Um, but then again, the fall of this empire is not just the fall of white supremacy, but the fall of capitalism itself. Now I know there are all kinds of complications in this process. For example, while uh, Venezuela and Bolivia and Nicaragua and other nations in South America are openly pursuing, Ecuador I should say, openly pursuing policies of socialism, the largest nation in the world, which is led by a communist party, is pursuing policies of state capitalism. Question becomes whether China, but not only does it pursue policies of state capitalism, which is not altogether wrong, by the way, there's a plausible explanation and justification, uh, I should say, if and only if the state, <laughs> only, <laughs> if, if and only if <laughs> the uh, policies of state capitalism lead to state socialism, but if state capitalist policies lead to uh, a form of free market capitalism, then it is a step back rather than a step forward. Now, the question becomes with a China. And then, of course, in foreign policy, the policies of appeasing the United States, especially in the UN Security Council. You know, why is China always voting with the United States for sanctions against North Korea or Iran or Libya or some other nation. You see what I'm saying? So it's a problem. So how do we explain the fact that you have this move towards socialism away from European capitalism towards a south-south new human uh, axis, but yet you have China seemingly going in the opposite direction. I would say the following, that in spite of that, what the dominant process in the world is, is growing unity against American empire and against American imperialism. Let me, I don't, I'm talking a little long. Uh, oh, thank you, okay. Uh, let me just say a couple of things and I want to say something about um, Du Bois and how Du Bois theorized the world uh, in the middle of the 20th century and how Hugo Chavez and Du Bois are in uh, parallel uh, modes of thought. If I were to make a prediction, and these are not earth shattering, the American economy and the European economies will not recover from this economic crisis. The stock market can continue to go up. It may it reach record levels last week, over 14,000 Wall Street uh, stock market. However, at the same time, unemployment remains at unbelievable high levels. And that's in the overall sense. But if you take 
specific communities like African Americans, we have unemployment at levels that under any normal conditions would be called a Great Depression. We have a generation of young people who will never work unless there's a fundamental change. Generations of young black men and women whose only future is the prison industrial complex and long periods in jail, where illiteracy, homelessness, death becomes their future. And it is not because something is wrong with them. It, this is because the system that organizes this economy has failed this nation and failed most people and failed black people. Now, so like Du Bois said in 1961, he, he decides that the work that he was doing intellectually and politically he could no longer do in this nation. It was a period of the Cold War. Du Bois was isolated. You know, Du Bois had literally educated in universities and colleges and in the broad community. Several generations of black intellectuals. He was their role model. But when the Cold War hits, People are afraid to have anything to do with Du Bois, afraid if Du Bois came to their door, to even answer the door. That, um, and so he felt, along with his wife, uh, Shirley Graham Du Bois, his second wife, that, well, we have an invitation from Kwame Nkrumah to go to Ghana and continue our work. Now, Du Bois at that time is about 93, but he's nowhere near thinking about death. He has work to do. <laughs> and the main work that he has to do when he goes to Ghana, he takes a, a lot of people with him, Alpheus Hunton, who you might not know his name off the top. There were people already there like Maya Angelou. There were many African Americans who went to this first independent nation in what they call black Africa because they wanted to help build it. So Du Bois is there and his thing that he wants to do is to restart the Encyclopedia of Africa. And as I said before, that this growing body of knowledge would be the foundation of the African University. It would shift the center and focus of learning in Africa from European text and European knowledge to African knowledge. That's what he goes for. But before he leaves, he does something else that literally shocks the nation and shocks black America. He joins the Communist Party. <laughs> And I have to say, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and um, well, I'll give some more. I'll come back to something. And he says he does this. Oh wow! Thanks a lot. He says he does this because capitalism cannot work, and he also says capitalism cannot be reformed. Well, this is what Hugo Chavez is saying in the 21st century. Most African Americans for the next 40 years would run away from Du Bois. You know, um, when I went to college, I knew of Du Bois. I heard of this mysterious, dangerous intellectual, but we didn't read a book by Du Bois at Lincoln. Uh, a black university. When I come, came to Temple, uh, I think that I 
uh, well, now Brandon. <laughs> uh, for a while, I, was, I taught the only course on Du Bois. And if you go to other universities, they don't teach Du Bois. Now, what happened? Why did Du Bois go from the most important black intellectual up to 1960s to an intellectual that you can't even read or hear about or learn about in the classroom? I won't even mention the public schools. Well, it was because Du Bois had committed the crime of crimes, political crime of crimes. He became a communist. And therefore, his name had to be taken out of public discourse. His books, perhaps the souls of black folk you could get, but certainly not black reconstruction, not the world in Africa, not color and democracy, not dark water. And when you talked about Du Bois, you could only talk about him as a black intellectual. And of course, that means that other intellectuals are real intellectuals. And here is a derivative kind of imitation, fake intellectual. Du Bois's work and name could only come back into some prominence after the end of the Cold War, with the collapse of the Soviet Union. It was only after 1992 that Du Bois then becomes a prominent intellectual that could be widely cited, at least in African American studies, if not in sociology, political science, philosophy, and other disciplines, which indicates that he was silenced because he was a communist and because he opposed American capitalism and American imperialism. Just one thing else. A lot of people don't know this. Du Bois was indicted, arrested, and put on trial in the 1950s by the federal government for the crime of advocating peace and against nuclear weapons. And uh, he luckily beat the case, but he was arrested in his 80s. And he would make the famous statement. He said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called communist. <laughs> Is that praise for the communists or condemnation for the peacemakers? <laughs> and that was the reality then. Uh, let me end here. We are in what can be called a period of transition. A transition from one social system that increasingly fails humanity and ordinary people to another social system that is governed by the needs of the people. However, every great transition in human history is preceded by a great struggle of ideas. You know, in our society, there is every effort at diversion, at obscurantism, at giving people things that they really don't need materially, spiritually, and intellectually. This um, obscurantism and diversionary culture is a way of trumping the ideological struggle. What is the, idea, what is the essence of the ideological struggle? The essence of the ideological struggle for us and for people in the world generally is what will the future be? Will the future be this old system or will it be something new? And along the way, as we fight for and imagine the future, there are obstacles that many of us don't yet see a deepening repression. You know, uh, last week, the Supreme Court rejected 
convicted. A case put before it by Amnesty International and the American Civil Liberties Union. And what they were asking the Supreme Court to do was to rule on whether or not the federal government had a right to go into your emails and foreign phone calls. The Supreme Court said we don't even want to hear it. There's another case that will be before the Supreme Court soon, and this is being brought by Chris Hedges and some other people, challenging those provisions in the National Defense Authorization Act, which says that if the government suspects you of being, quote, a terrorist, or aligned with terrorists, or a friend of terrorists, then you can be locked up indefinitely. The other side of this is this narrowing of ordinary people's access and freedom of the internet. Giving the government and the internet providers control over what you can do and so on on the internet. If you're on Facebook, you just have to accept the fact that you're being monitored. If you tweet, you're being monitored, you know what I'm saying? This tightening of the government's control over what individuals think, what individuals can communicate to other people, uh, what, what we can do in terms of protest is what I would call a form of crypto-fascism. Crypto means fascism in a disguised form. Now what is fascism? Fascism, in its classic definition, is a repressive, some would say, terroristic dictatorship of the most reactionary forces of the banking and financial oligarchy. That small one-tenth of one percent who wishes to control the world and in order to do that must also control the American population will go to any lengths to make sure that its power and its rule is not challenged in any fundamental way. Du Bois leaves the country in 1961. He dies in 1963 in Ghana. His body is buried there. He is memorialized by leaders from throughout the world, from China, from Korea, from Africa, and Kwame Nkrumah memorializes him as the father of Pan-Africanism. Zhou Enlai, the head of state of China, calls him a progressive who ultimately took the path of consistent revolution. In two days, Hugo Chavez will have his state funeral. At this moment, he lies in state uh, I was looking at on, um, on, on, on live stream on the internet as his remains were being taken from the military hospital where he died to um, a military academy where his body will lay in state. And it was very moving to see the Venezuelan people hundreds of thousands of them walking with and in this procession. And I guess there's nothing as painful and sad as a whole nation that is grieving. And that's what you see. The Venezuelan people are grieving, but so should we. And we have every reason and should not be quiet about it to express human solidarity but political solidarity with the people of Venezuela. Hugo Chavez, the 21st century Simone Bolivar is also a great humanist. 
He means so much to us, and we have so much to learn from the Bolivarian Revolution. So with that, I thank you very much. <laughs> 